This is a test. <laughs> to love one another. And that was the first one. Uh, it's mentioned more times in the New Testament than any one of the other 59 one another's. We find that command to love one another nine times in the New Testament. If you don't believe me, go through the New Testament fully, all verse by verse, and see if that's not right. Nine times you'll find the command to love one another. It might surprise you, perhaps, that the second most repeated one another command in the New Testament is to, guess what? It's in your bullet. I made that, that's an open book test, as they call it. Greet one another. Greet one another. Can you believe that? The second most repeated command in the New Testament is to greet one another. And I'm suggesting to us today in the message that this command, which may sound kind of strange as the most, or at least second most repeated command, is probably far more relevant to our culture and our society today and to our church, our church, than we might realize at first. And the one instance of its use that we are looking at this morning is in the first 16 verses of Romans chapter 16. And while it will be on the screen, you might want to turn to it in your Bible because uh, when I refer to it in the sermon, not all of the passage will be on your screen. You know, as you see, we can only get three or four verses at most on one screen. I'm going to read this in a minute. Uh, a text like this is a challenge to read because you're going to see 26 names that I'm going to try to pronounce in these 16 verses. And it's tempting, when, if, if any of you have read through the Bible or you try to read through a book of the Bible like in this case the book of Romans, when you get to a passage like this with all these names, uh, you're tempted to try to just skip through it or skim through it and not pay a whole lot of attention to what's being said along with those names. But there, are, this passage, along with many others like it, you'll find in this passage a great treasure. Not only noting Paul's frequent use of the word to greet, but also in seeing the relationship he has with each of these 26 people in this church at Rome. And uh, let me tell you, Paul has never been to this church yet. And he's greeting 26 people there he already knows. So what we see here especially is the importance of the relationships he has with his fellow Christians. And the difference, no doubt, it has made in his life and the relationship Paul has had with these 26 people. The importance of his relationship to them. And these are the people he's greeting. So... I'm going to do, I'm going to turn and read it from this screen since uh, the words are pretty big back there from my screen, but they're even better up here. So Paul says, as he greets the people here, this is at the very last chapter of his book, of his letter. I commend to, your, to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon in the church, or of the church in Sincrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give you excuse me, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Proverbs, province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. Greet Apellus, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet Asyndritus, Plagu, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters went with them. Greet Philobolus, Junia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. 
you have given us these people who are sitting with us this morning and others of this congregation who cannot be here. They are indeed our brothers and sisters in Christ. And throughout the time we have known each other, Lord, they have been a blessing to us and we to them. And so, Lord, help us with joy and love and enthusiasm. Always be ready and hopeful and excited to greet one another as we come together, not only in this place on a Sunday morning, but in all the other ways we connect with each other throughout the week. As we remember how important we are to one another, how we have blessed our lives, and how we hopefully also, Lord, are blessing each other. So Lord, bless us as we share this time of remembering how important it is to truly, lovingly, and sincerely greet one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me point your attention to that very last verse. Uh, that's where the title of the sermon, uh, the, at least the abbreviated, uh, I basically abbreviated that verse. Greet one another. I'm not going to suggest to you that every time you see each other, you kiss one another. However, this is a perfect Valentine's sermon, right? <laughs> it's perfect for that. Obviously, we here in America, most, for the most part, when we meet someone we know, don't greet each other with a kiss. Or, uh, like you see many people, I guess I would call it the Mediterranean or, Ameri or, or maybe the European way of greeting. You sort of kiss the air on the, either side of the cheek of someone else. Uh, I don't know if that's a custom for any of you, uh, but I'm not suggesting that we begin that practice. Uh, but the intent of this is not so much how you greet, but what your attitude is in your greeting. What are you presenting and showing to that other person by how we greet them? What Paul is emphasizing is not so much that Mediterranean way of greeting, but the act of greeting itself. Greeting is important in our Christian lives and in our churches. And one reason I think this is especially important today is that people more and more are feeling isolated and disconnected, perhaps more than ever. Loneliness in America is really at epidemic proportions and we know that COVID over the last three years now has only worsened this other epidemic, the epidemic of loneliness. Uh, a recent Harvard study has said that at least, this was done in 2021, so it's probably worse today, at least 36% of Americans are experiencing severe loneliness. And that study shows that two particular groups are suffering the most. 61% of young adults between the ages of 20, excuse me, of 18 to 25 are suffering the most in terms of loneliness. And 51% of mothers with young children. Of course, just because you may live with others does not prevent the possibility of loneliness. And we know that loneliness, especially severe loneliness, can lead to anxiety and depression and to the unfortunate consequences that those sometimes have. But there's another ongoing study at Harvard. It actually began in 1935 and it's still ongoing. Back in 1935, one of the departments of, on adult development uh, started a study of some of their sophomores at Harvard College along with a group of inner city men in Boston. And they have been following that same group of men, both from both groups, from the college and from the inner city, ever since then, following not only those original group, but their descendants and their spouses. And what they found, or at least they're still finding, is that people who are most satisfied and happy in their lives are the people who have maintained and have quality relationships with other people, with friends, with family, with co-workers, with fellow church members. Now that shouldn't surprise us, right? <laughs> uh, the better your relationships with other people, the less likely you're going to be lonely, and the more likely you're going to be happy and satisfied with your life. God told us that in the book of first, I guess it's actually the second or third chapter of Genesis, it's not good for a man to be alone, and it's not good for a woman to be alone either. God made us for relationships, for 
friends, for family, for spouses. God made us for relationships. We need each other. Life cannot be good. Life cannot be what God intended it to be without those relationships that keep us from not just being alone, but certainly keep us from being lonely. That's what makes, a large part at least, what makes for a good life. And the church, I believe, can and must be a part of the quality relationships that make life good and make for the eternal life that God and Jesus came to give us. And one of the ways that we maintain and nurture and nourish our relationships is by sincerely and lovingly greeting one another when we meet. So I'm suggesting that this tiny little nugget, those first three words of verse 16 of Romans 16, are one of the most important remedies for loneliness in our society. So again, the point here is not how we greet, but do we greet sincerely? What I learned this week in studying for this sermon was that the Greek word for greet, for greet, the Greek word for greet, actually means to, <coughs> excuse me, to embrace. So whether we greet someone with a handshake, or with a hello, or hi, it's so good to see you, and hopefully when we're looking into their eyes, we are at least giving them a spiritual embrace. We need embracing in that way. So Paul is emphasizing here that our greeting, whatever form it may take, was to be holy and marked by love. And we're really glad to be in each other's presence, no matter what form that greeting might take. So greeting one another in the church is to be something special, more than just uh, put pretend politeness or just a heartless routine. It was to be with affection from the heart, with no deception or ulterior motives. So how we greet one another should signify in a sincere and powerful way that you and I have all been made one in Jesus. We're all one. We're one family. We're one body. The church is to be a place where everyone is to be loved and included in Christ. No matter who you are, you are welcomed here by all of us. Whatever form our greeting takes, it should let everyone know that they are welcome here. Don't you just hate it when other people seem to just intentionally ignore you? Have you ever had that experience? Or it just seems that others are just intentionally ignoring you? One of the unfortunate experiences I've had in church over uh, the years of my life is I've seen how when someone is, is not really welcomed in a church, even though they might have been a member for a long time or maybe a short time, one of the ways uh, they choose one of the things that leads them to choosing to leave that church is because a lot of other members of the church decided intentionally to ignore them. That is a Christian event. We are not going to ignore anyone here. So therefore we can see the emphasis on reading throughout the rest of Romans 16. It almost <coughs> sounds as though Paul is reading through the church membership list. He's got the church directory, and he's reading through that list and sort of greeting, and not just sort of, greeting each and every one of them, and there is a great treasure really in that list of names. You can tell that his life has been deeply touched by all of these 26 people, who apparently have all ended up in the church at Rome. And what's so amazing about this is, as I said, Paul's never been to Rome. Their relationships he has built over the years in all of his travels and through his many letters. He genuinely loves and cares about every single one of these 26 people. So Romans 16, these first 16 verses, is a flesh and blood example of how the church should be about personal relationships. And as I one of the challenges that most preachers have is that we try to put about four or five sermons into one. There are just too many points to remember. 
So one nugget to bring out, or hopefully that you might get out of this sermon, among others, that hopefully will stick in our brains and in our spirits, is that churches often have to make decisions, right? We often have to make decisions. But one thing I want to suggest to you is that relationships within the church are more important than decisions. Now, there are some decisions that sometimes a church has to make that may cause conflict, that may even lead some members to leave. And if the decision is so important that you ruin relationships, well, maybe you have to make that decision. But I want to suggest that probably 99% of the decisions a church has to make should never hurt our relationships with one another. We must protect the eternal value that each and every one of our relationships has with one another. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here, how important these relationships are to him and to the church and to the church throughout the world. It's in our relationships where the church truly becomes transformative in your life and in mine. So our powerful personal relationships begin with the way we welcome and receive one another. They're also nourish one another. Let me give you a couple of ways in which this passage shows how greeting is powerful. First of all, the power of names. This is no generic greeting. Paul isn't just, you know, Paul could have just in one verse said, say hi to everybody. <laughs> no, he wanted to make sure everyone knew that he was thinking about them and cared about them. So Paul gives a special greeting to every single one of these people. And we might find it remarkable that he takes time to greet every single one of these 26 people. So what does that tell us? It is so important, therefore, to learn and use each other's names. And when someone actually says your name, we usually perk up and listen. We pay attention. We know our names are important to us, right? Uh, if someone just had to, had to say, hey, you, uh, that wouldn't endear us to them, or at least not automatically would it. Therefore, it's important for us in the church, and probably every, most every uh, person in this room today knows everyone else's name, right? Probably. Uh, you wouldn't have a problem rem remembering and calling each other by name. Uh, some of us, as we get older, get better at remembering faces than we do names. Uh, so there might still be some people, at least in your church roster, that maybe uh, you might see them and not remember their name. But remember how important it is to speak the other person's name. Because probably to most people, their name is pretty important to them. Uh, and to share and to speak their name as you greet them says, you were really important to me. You're important enough to me to remember and to say your name. To value another person's name is to value them. Therefore, to use their name in a warm and personal way is to honor them as a fellow brother or sister in Christ. And uh, while you might not have that problem of remembering names, at least in our fellowship here, it shows your love and concern for another person if you have forgotten their name, to go ahead and ask. Because again, that shows how important that other person is to you. But you know, in this list, there's some amazing things about the names that shed some light on the incredible depth and breadth of the word greets, and its power to bring a large mix of people together. For one thing, these names, these 26 names, includes both Jews and Gentiles. And at least before the Christian era, Jews and Gentiles didn't mix with each other. Uh, Gentiles were considered unclean by their Jewish neighbors and the Jews would not have anything to do with it. But here in the Christian church, that has changed. Jews and Gentiles are now brothers and sisters in Christ. Our fellowship, therefore, in the Christian church is greater than any racial, cultural, or ethnic difference. It doesn't matter what your yearly income is, what kind of house you live in, or what kind of car you drive. We are all one in Christ. We are all one in Christ. And that's what this large array of different names shows us in the church now in Rome. Several of these names were common slave names. 
These were names given to slaves. These were names not used by people in the upper classes. A few of those names, though, do come from the upper class. Narcissus was a rich and powerful man who had influence, we understand from other history, with the Emperor of Rome. Uh, you need people in the Christian church who have ties with those in power. Bible scholars believe that Aristobulus was the grandson of Herod the Great. And what do we know about Herod the Great? He tried to kill baby Jesus. And his son wasn't even much better. But here is someone descended from the tempted killer of Jesus who did kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem, who is now Christian. And someone valued by Paul. See what Christ can do in the lives of people. And in the church, it doesn't matter what side of the tracks you come from or in which neighborhood you live. Again, no matter who you are. Nine of the 26 names mentioned are women, and five of them are especially commended for their ministry. In first century Roman culture, you would never see any public recognition of a woman. So in the church, gender differences don't make any difference. We are all called as leaders within the church. We are all ministers of great value. So no wonder that Paul could write in his other letter to the Galatians and say, in Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul emphasizes for real here by listing the names of all those who are one in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we also see in this text the power of just the word hello. There is something very endearing and disarming with a warm hello. When you genuinely feel that someone is happy to see you, it makes you feel loved and wanted. And therefore, not only should we be happy to be here, we should be happy that you're here too. No one should feel lonely, neglected, or overlooked in the church. This is also why the way we greet and welcome visitors to the church is so important. Whenever we see someone new in church, we do need to take time to welcome them and include them, though probably we shouldn't overwhelm them. We can't go overboard sometimes. We should greet them first, and then take care of everything else that we might normally do when we get to church on a Sunday morning. I've heard of churches that practice this two-minute rule. For the first two minutes after church, you should talk to people you don't know. I know that might not be hard here uh, on most Sundays, but consider that two-minute rule when a rule when we end our service. Make sure you talk to someone you don't know, or maybe you haven't talked to in a while, who is here most every Sunday. And that's why the first part of the sermon title: No Holy Huddles. It's typical in many churches that we huddle together with the people we are most comfortable with and, and like and want to talk to or whatever. Holy huddles don't do much for visitors. You see, our, you see, greeting our fellow church members is essential to maintaining and strengthening our bonds of love and that hold us together. But greeting our those who come as guests is also essential because... Our greeting may be their first introduction to Jesus and to what it would mean to be a part of this family. I don't know if you know this, but studies show that within 10 minutes of a new person coming onto the church grounds and coming into a worship service, within 10 minutes they've decided whether they're ever going to come back again. And that's before they've even heard the sermon. So that includes the appearance of the church, can they figure out how to get in and where to go, and what kind of greeting they get by the people they first see. Uh, are they ignored? Are they greeted warmly? By the time they've sit in, uh, by the time there's been a few for maybe a few minutes, they've already decided whether they're going to come back or not. So how we greet one another, both our 
fellow members and those are, who are our guests is essential to extending the kingdom of God and really increasing the number of new members we receive here. One church I saw had a sign out at the, uh, out the front next to the road, we are the end of your search for the friendly church. <laughs> and at least your reputation, at least I've been hearing from your fellow members is, this is a friendly church and you probably couldn't put out there that this really is the end of your search for a friendly church. And it's important that we be friendly. It is. But you know, most people, though it's not true of all people, who would dare to darken the doors of our church who haven't been coming before, you know what they're looking for? Yes, it would be helpful if this is a friendly church. But more than being friendly, I need friends. I need friends. But it's how we greet that will give evidence to someone searching for friends whether they might find some here. And that's really, especially how small our churches grow, really larger churches grow too, we adopt people. We adopt them, spiritually. We, we help them to know they are welcome here, and they can find friends here. And it's safe to be here. That's what we want to project how we greet one another. I know Colonial Park Community Baptist Church is and wants to continue to be even more of a church that values people and that values our relationships that we have. Remember the first and second most important commandments of Jesus, love God and love others. It all hangs on those two things. So this kind of sincere greeting adds greatly to our experience of the Christian life and to the faith that we have. Let me invite us to pray together. Father in heaven, how good it is to know that in this very room, in this sanctuary, we are welcomed by you and by our fellow worshipers. In this very room, because of who you are and who these brothers and sisters are to us, here in this place we do indeed find love, we find joy and hope and power, and even and especially for us with all of our quirks, with all of our shortcomings and with all of our failures, we are welcome here. For in this very room, Jesus, the one who died for us while we were still sinners, Jesus himself is in this very room, and he welcomes us and embraces us with open arms. And his welcome is echoed in the welcome and greetings we receive from each other. So thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given us life eternal, which we enjoy here and now in this church family called Colonial Park Community Baptist Church. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. And the greeting and joy that we experience here is greatly adds to the blessed assurance that not only is Jesus mine, but I am his, and we truly belong to each other both now and forever. So we'll stand and